Okay, this week, everybody, we're going to be working on a very, very important aspect of your essay, and that's going to be your introduction. And most especially to your introduction is going to be the type of hook that you're going to use to get your reader's attention. And that's all a hook does. It grabs, reaches out, it grabs someone or something, and it pulls that person nearer. It wants to get you into the content of your paper. Think of this as a first date. When someone reads an article in a newspaper or a book or anything else, they look at the back cover or they look at the very first beginning part of the book. In an essay, we read the introduction and the title. We're looking for something that will get us so interested in it that we will take our time to continue to read that essay. And your essay is going to be the same way. I want you to pretend like you're writing this essay where millions of people are going to read it and they're going to get back to you on how they thought your essay was or how important that was to their own life or experiences. What students tend to do is just write to the teacher and they know it's just one person that's going to look at it so they don't really delve deeply into how to catch the reader's attention. But I'm telling you that is one of the most crucial activities, or should I say the most crucial skill that you can get for your writing is to get someone interested in what you have to say. Okay, so we're going to look at the types of hooks that are at the academic level that could really add zest and interest and intrigue, mystery and provocativeness into your paper. Now I used a few vocabulary words that you might want to look up like intrigue, which means mystery that you really want to pursue. Or provocative, meaning that it's challenging, or it's controversial, or it's shocking. So these are the kinds of things that get our attention. So let's kind of go through this and see what is it that we need when we look at a hook. Okay. So there are many different types of hooks, and one of the first hooks that we can look is a shocking statistic. And the shocking statistic means something that's not, someone goes, oh, that's interesting, or yeah, I kind of knew that. But a shocking statistic or an interesting statistic that would get you thinking and have you look at a problem in a different way. So here it says to start with a relevant or provoking st statistic. Relevant because why use it if you're not going to tie it into your own ideas or your own thesis statement? So you definitely want to make it relevant. And another thing that you want to do with anything that you use as a hook you need to tie it in and explain it to the reader. You don't let it just sit there and die. You make your quote, you make your statistic or whatever else that you're using, and then you write something to show the connection between this hook and your particular point of view, whatever it is that you're writing about. So, um, so statistics are one of the most common ways that academic writers will use to, to bring in a reader to their paper. Another type of hook is a song lyric. Now this is often overlooked because people don't think of song lyrics in academic papers, but sometimes there are song lyrics that can actually um, make it interesting and um, have the person go, oh, I remember that song, and oh, I can see how the lyrics to that song would get you thinking about the content of what I'm about to write about. And I've tried to choose everything that I'm showing you today based on what might fit with Jeanette and how she overcame obstacles in her life based on the alcoholism, the poverty, the mental illness, um, the abuse, the neglect, the abandonment, everything that she dealt with as a child. I try to use these hooks in relation to the paper that um, is being written. Okay, so we can look add a lyric from a song, and this was a popular song, at least in America, that we can look at. When you look at obstacles with a positive view, then it takes takes away your dark clouds. And, uh, and that is, uh, can be very uplifting. So one of the ways that you could think about, and it could be a song in your own language, you just have to interpret it, of course, into English. But if there's a song that really speaks to you, and you think you can relate it to your essay, then do so. And you're going to really need to have your thesis statement in mind when you write your hook. Because again, you have to tie that 
to your thesis and make it seem like it flows or it's relevant. And I'm going to give you four examples at the end of this presentation on how I took some of these techniques and I tied it into an introduction. Okay. Another kind of hook is a poem, and poems are very, um, are almost magical. They're insightful and they speak to people's hearts and they can be metaphorical, they can be figurative, uh, where you have to interpret their meaning to dig deep into what the author's trying to say. And everyone likes a puzzle that they have to solve. So um, poems can be like that. So use some verses from a poem to tie your ideas together. And um, uh, this one is from Broken Home. And again, I put this to show um, the outward appearance of some things cannot really reflect the inward appearance. And um, it's about a father and daughter, and this is kind of talking to the relationship that um, Jeanette had with uh, Rex Walls, her father. And uh, sometimes it was, it was happy and laughing and smiling. And other times there were secrets that uh, the house hides. And she was really um, crying and, and people she knew were dying. Um, through alcoholism. So this is very symbolic of what she was going through. So maybe I'll think of this poem to use, or maybe I'll choose a different one. We can look at hooks as a metaphor, and metaphors are used all the time in writing. Um, the, uh, the dangers of housekeeping that you guys read last week, there are so many metaphors in that particular piece to make it funny. Uh, the refrigerator was lying in wait. Um, there were things that, that the house was out to get her, and there was metaphors in there. So you can add something like, Jeanette had a will of iron, but a, high, but a heart of gold. So a heart of gold, meaning it's priceless, and it's very open and wonderful to experience. Uh, but a will of iron, mean, meaning that she wasn't going to be broken, and um, she was forged in iron by all of her negative experiences, but once it cooled, once it was over, she was strong as iron, and and she was able to lead her life um, very, very strongly, very adeptly, um, with great courage and great skill. Even throughout her childhood, she was able to do this. So metaphors paint a picture for your reader to get into your meaning as well. And it's not just boring text that just lies there on the page, it, it's an image which is what metaphors do, of two unseemingly, two unseemingly unseeming things like gold and a heart. How do you put those two together and how do we make meaning from that? Okay, so <clears throat> metaphors are a great way to bring interest to your paper. Quotations are, are often used in academic papers. We see this all the time. Um, we usually, in academic papers, try to incorporate a quote from someone who is well-known or well-regarded, or it is so profound or that it opens your eyes in such a way that you've got to use it, even if the author is not known. And um, again, I chose this, this quote from a very successful woman scientist who uh, never gave up, and she talks about perseverance and confidence and... Um, and even though that life is not easy for any of us, but what of that? We must persevere. And she's very respected. This is Marie Curie, again, who um, discovered curium. And uh, we can tie that into how strong and how resourceful Jeanette was, or whoever your character is that you've chosen to highlight in your thesis statement. We can use a proverb. Now, every culture has a proverb, which is just a little saying that teaches us a lesson. It gives us a kind of an analogy or a idiom or a saying that teaches us a lesson. And it makes us think. So I have an Amish proverb here. Amish is a, is a very um, devout people that live usually in Pennsylvania, but other places in the United States. And they really work on character. So I chose a proverb from the Amish people, and they said, good character, like good soup, is usually homemade. And the reader can interpret that in many different ways, but we're looking at how someone lives his or her life, and when it's usually homemade, that means childhood, generally, that 
you were made by your childhood and any positive or negative experiences that came out of that childhood was made in the home, usually. And so your character, and especially your good character, is often homemade. And I'm going to, my job, which I'm going to use this proverb in one of my introductions, my job is to show that even though Jeanette had some very difficult and heartbreaking things happen to her in her childhood, she had some great things happen to her childhood. And because of this homemade experiences, her character turned out to be very good. Okay, so there's a proverb. Again, there's proverbs all over. If you are a religious person, you can find proverbs in the Bible. You can pro find proverbs in the Quran. You can find proverbs with Buddha. Um, many different religions have sayings that teach. Okay. We have fables. Now, fables, and many cultures have these as well. A fable is like a, like a proverb, but it's more of a story. And what makes it a fable is that it has to deal with animals acting like humans. So that's not true, but, and we, we usually teach fables to children because children love animals and they can relate to animals. And it's put in a childlike language generally to show the relationship of what animals learn to our own life. So um, we can emphasize our point by telling this story, this fable that's not true, but is interesting because we're learning from animals. The boy who cried wolf, for example, is a fable because um, it's, uh, it deals with an animal. However, the wolf did not take on a human character. But uh, the tortoise and the hare, you know, the, the fast rabbit who ran and ran, he was very arrogant. And the turtle, who was slow and steady, um, that's, and they talked to each other. And the tortoise won in the end because he was... He was a uh, he was perse he persevered and he was very patient. So a way I might use this fable because it is very simple and they're short is to copy this fable onto my introduction. Of course, I would cite it, and it's an Aesop fable, which is they're very well known and been around for a long time. But I'd still cite where I got the fable, and I would just repeat the story about the mother telling the son how to walk and when he says for her to show him how to do it she can't do it herself because she can't follow her own example and so I just thought that would be an interesting way to connect uh, if somebody was talking about this the relationship between Jeanette and her mother how the mother was pretty selfish and you know her art supplies a bow and arrow um, not cooking not cleaning she just really checked out of the family to pursue her own interest. So she told the children how to act and how to be, but she, she had a very hard time following her own advice. So this fable has the same, the same lesson, so I might be able to, to tie the fable into the introduction. Okay, let's see what's next here. So then we have a parable, and a parable is a story, but usually dealing with humans, not necessarily animals as they take on human qualities, but as um, uh, you find them often in religious text, uh, many in the Bible, um, that teach a story about how we should be live our lives through the experiences that we have. And this particular fable is about a rich man taking his son to show the son the poor people and actually, when he looked at the poor people that he saw, the son internalized it a different way. He actually saw that they were more free with their environment than he and his father, who happened to be rich. I'll let you read the story, and you can draw your own conclusions or your own comparison between how this could be a positive parable for how Jeanette and her family lived. A lot of people went, wow, they didn't hardly have food, they didn't have electricity, um, they saw domestic violence, they, they did get exposed to all that, but they also got exposed to the father giving them the stars for their for their Christmas present and or their birthday present. And he took them to many different places and wanted them to explore the Grand Canyon and, and taught them how to swim in, in um, 
what they call hot pots or hot springs, things like that. He really exposed them to nature and how to appreciate that, and there's no cost to nature. So this particular parable about how the the rich boy sees he and his father as poor because they don't have this access to the environment, we can make that connection to Jeanette and the father's ability to expose them to all the great things the world did have to offer in its natural beauty. Okay? So the parable is a message that it gives us some kind of moral, some lesson at the end of the story that's universal to all human beings. It might teach us about love or triumph or nature or family or respect, but something that all cultures, all human beings are connected to. Okay. Um, you could use a joke or a pun or some kind of humor uh, with our particular topic is a little bit tougher because we're talking about some serious issues. And um, so it might not be appropriate to use humor in a particular essay, but I don't know what aspect of Jeanette's story you're talking about in your thesis. So there might be some humor that you use to introduce um, the topic. I just want you to know it's there. I'm not saying necessarily use it for yours this time around, but there may be a time where the humor is appropriate and it can be very engaging to your reader and brings your reader in because everybody likes to laugh. Okay, so I just put a kind of a silly grammar joke up here that has nothing to do with um, nothing to do with our story at all. Just kind of a silly joke. If I was teaching grammar, well, I am teaching grammar. I might start my lesson with that. And people who understand the tenses would understand the joke. Okay? All right. Um, well, here's one of a common way that we use to introduce our particular topic in our introduction. And that is starting with a question. But what most students do is they just ask one question and they leave it and they go on. But I want to introduce you to this thought of asking questions in successive order or repetitious order. So if you ask three questions in a row that make the reader think about the issue that you are bringing up or the controversy or whatever it's going to be, then you're, you're diving deeper into what you want readers to think about. So it gives a rhythm. It gives kind of a melody, a song kind of thing when you ask these three questions. So I gave an example right here on your example. If um, I'm talking about alcoholism and overcoming the problems of being a child of an alcoholic, so I might start my introduction with three successive questions like, how does a child whose father was an alcoholic learn to forgive his actions? How does the child become successful and not repeat the failings of the parent? How does the child find joy from a childhood that most would find hellish or difficult or problematic or whatever word you want to use there? But notice I put it kind of in a, you don't have to do this. I mean, you can ask your three questions and they don't have to have a rhythm. But I want to show you how does the duh, how does the child, how does the child, how does the child. It kind of gives you this repetitive pattern and lulls you in like, like a song would, okay, or like a poem would. So again, it's, it's getting into the psyche or to the consciousness of your reader and getting them to get to the beat of your writing. So, dun 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 You see? Okay, just a suggestion there. Another kind of hook is an anecdote. And an anecdote is a personal story. It often is funny, uh, but it doesn't have to be. But people will tell a short, short story of an experience in their life and connect it to whatever they're going to be talking about in their paper or their essay. Um, it personalizes the, the interaction between you and the reader. <clears throat> and, um, nope, went too far here. And people like, like authors to be personal and draw into us their life. That's why we, we have so many reality shows. We, we're drawn into people's lives and their struggles and their triumphs and everything. So <clears throat> sharing a story that's related to your thesis and tie that together is very powerful and you, you can move a person. Sometimes you can move them to tears. You can move them to want to read more, 
you can actually get them to think about their own experience. Maybe they're a child of an alcoholic or a parent uh, suffered as a child of an alcoholic. Maybe they're going through it right now. Maybe they're the alcoholic themselves. Something about your personal story can touch our own experiences in our own lives and, and draw those parallels, those connections. Okay? And I'll have an example of an anecdote for you. And then you guys did an extended definition. And you could do another one and actually add that into your introduction. You might be talking about perseverance or alcoholism or um, sexual abuse or whatever it is that you're talking about. You could take that definition and fill out a chart and then use that definition as part of your introduction so your reader is educated on your topic at a deeper level. And oh, I loved your definitions. The, the definitions all of you turned in were fabulous and um, loved them. So you could do another one like that and then you could almost have your entire introduction with your thesis by doing an extended definition. And it's very academic, highly regarded in as you go up in the English levels. It's a highly regarded way of doing an academic essay is to do an extended definition. And if you want examples of that, if you go back to chapter one, there were two or three stories that um, gave examples of extended definitions. We'll give that a try. So um, another type of hook is to bring a challenge or a controversy or something people would argue about. You provoke them. That means you shock them and you want them to fight with you or question you. So um, intrigue is, is a way of providing a little bit of mystery or interest uh, about why you feel this opposite way that you do. Or, you know, most people don't feel that way. Why are you making this very um, controversial or outrageous statement? I want to know why you feel this way, because I certainly don't. So I might make a statement like, poverty does not always impoverish the spirit. In other words, um, sometimes poverty enriches you, and that just seems like it's a, um, oh, what do we call it? It's not a conundrum, but I'll think of it in a minute. But uh, it's it's opposite of what you think it should be, okay? Or it's ironic or something to that effect. So I might want to read more to figure out why the author feels this way. Or I might say something like three myths about child neglect that are surprising, so a myth, myth is usually something false, and why is it surprising? Now I've got to read this paper to find out what are my thoughts about child neglect that are opposite or surprising about the way I might already think about it. So see how I'm trying to hook you? I'm trying to get you interested in my paper by being more creative in the way I put it out there. Or something I might say that people disagree with a hands-off approach to parenting may be better a better alternative for today's youth. So we look at the book of Jeanette, and, and the parents had a hands-off approach, and, and that had some really harsh consequences, like Jeanette cooking hot dogs as three years old over the stove and getting burned, or um, the children having to, to find food any way that they can. So how can I show that a hands-off approach could be better for our kids today? What is it about that that has any kind of benefit or measure of quality that that my reader would find acceptable? Okay? So here I have an introduction with a proverb for you. And I'm actually going to come out of this because I, I want to highlight some things in different color. I want to show you that I have in every single introduction, I have background information. So in the background information, get rid of that. In the background information, what I do is I make a statement of what child abuse and child neglect is. And that's that's the angle I'm taking is child abuse, child neglect. So I wrote a little bit of background of what it is, and I'm going to use that little bit of background in each of my introductions. Okay, so that is that's the important part to, to note. So here is something I, now I wrote this particular part on the top of my head because just as a, a peace officer 
So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and highlight that. I'm going to highlight that in purple. And so this is going to maintain, I'm going to say the same thing in every introduction, but my hook is going to be different. So for your introduction, everybody, you are going to need to have background information. People need to know what you're talking about. Okay, so that's going to be an important piece to you. So I wrote one of the most pervasive and heartbreaking social issues facing thousands of children today is the occurrence of neglect, child neglect or abuse. These children will suffer and endure many obstacles that can include physical and sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, hunger, poverty, abandonment, homelessness, and many other damaging situations that can affect them into their adult lives. Okay, now if you don't have this background information when you start your paper, you go out and do a little research on the internet. But if you use something based on the internet, you're going to have to cite it. So copy and paste the internet um, URL that you went and borrowed the information. Get the author's name if you can and exactly where you got the information. Because if you don't use your own information, you have to cite it. Well, this in purple is mine because, again, um, just being my age and having lived in our culture all my life, and having been a peace officer with me going into homes where children were hurt, abused, neglected, things like that, I can write this sentence and I don't have to cite it because this comes from my own brain and my own heart. Now, I used a little bit more of higher level vocabulary, but I want you to use your vocabulary for right now and then later I'm going to have you go back and use a thesaurus and to use synonyms that will bring your vocabulary to a higher level. Now, pervasive just for you means that it stretches um, and goes deeper and longer than what we expect. Something that's pervasive just keeps going and it penetrates um, the situation. So it's it keeps going. So child child neglect's not a one time thing. It just it just keeps happening and occurring, okay? And I think you know what heartbreaking means. And um, I think that was really the only vocabulary word that I might have used that may you may or may not know. Okay, now, in a different color here, I'm going to show you, so this is gonna be my background information. I'm gonna use it on all my introduction examples that I'm gonna give you. Now I'm gonna tie it. Here it's the bad things. But my thesis statement is going to talk about the good things Jeanette has. So I have to show a transition of opposite. See, here's my thesis, everybody. Now let me find it. Of course, it's going to be the last line. Okay, so I went ahead and did all the colors so I wouldn't, wasn't taking your time. So we know that the purple here is from my head. No citation needed. It's because this is... Uh, my own words and my own thoughts, okay? Then I wanted to use the proverb. So I decided to use the Amish, pro the Amish proverb. And the proverb here is in orange. And this is what I have in quotations because that's the actual proverb. Those aren't my words. So I started with the sentence and then I said, however, there is an Amish proverb that suggests, those are my words, and then I'm going to quote the proverb, because those are not my words. Good character, like good soup, is usually homemade. And then, since those are not my words, I use the website where I used to go get that proverb. Okay. And then uh, later on, I'm going to show you how to cite in MLA format. And I'm going to show you how to make a works cited page. That's not this lesson. That's not this week. But just because I am using other people's words and works, I want to show you that I will always cite anything that's not mine. Okay, whether I do a direct quote or I paraphrase, even paraphrase has to be cited. Okay, so that's the orange is the proverb. And now in the green, the green again is actually my own word. So I should have made this purple, but I've made it green because I wanted to show you I needed to connect the proverb to my thesis, which is in blue. 
Okay, so I needed to connect the proverb to the thesis. So I had to write a line that put these two together. So I said, so here we have the Amish proverb, and now I've got to take that, and I say, in the novel The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls, the reader learns just how much excellent character is shaped by the negative circumstances she faced as a child. So I'm taking this, this proverb about how um, good character is homemade, and I'm telling them that Jeanette had this childhood that shaped her excellent character. So I brought these two together, and now I can go into my thesis. Jeanette Wall's personal success later in life was the result of being forced to be resourceful, have courage, and raise herself without the benefit of effective parenting. So that's the use of the proverb. So it just makes it interesting. But remember, always connect your proverb, your quote, your story, your statistic, your lyric, whatever, to your thesis. So you have to explain it. Don't just let it sit there dead and unmoving. All right, so I'm going to go to the next one. And we're just going to... Um, I'm once again going to highlight in color so you can see what's mine, what's the hook, what's the connecting sentence, what's the thesis. So let's do the next one. And we'll go from there. Okay, so here's the next one. And let's go ahead and do the connection with colors. Okay, so in this next slide, I went ahead and I, I did all the colors for you just not to waste your time. So here we have in purple. It's the thing I made up on the from my own head, and I'm going to use that in every slide. That's my introduction. I don't want to have to redo that every time because everyone's introduction has to have background information about your topic. The orange is the hook that I'm using. In this case, I'm going to use a quote. So I say, we know that I start with negative aspects of neglect and um, child abuse and child neglect, okay? Then I say, in fact, so I'm proving, I'm proving what I'm about to say right. In fact, in the article, The Resiliency of Adult Children of Alcoholics, notice that I'm giving the source, Dr. Ron um, Brezelay, notice I'm giving the author, states, quote, because these are not my words, and I'm using a quotation, in order to thrive and survive in an alcoholic environment, these individuals must develop and maintain problem-solving skills and behaviors that contribute to their own self-enhancement along with behavior and cognitive competencies. Okay. In other words, these individuals must continuously work in building and maintaining their resiliency. And my whole thesis talks about how these individuals who are children of um, adult children of alcoholics have to overcome it and solve problems and be resilient. They have to persevere and um, how to be resourceful. So now I've got to take that quotation and I've got to hook it to my thesis. I got it, I got to explain it. So I just use the same explanation as I did in my last slide. You see in the novel, The Glass Castle, here in the book, The Glass Castle. And then I, I use a little bit of different wording to show how this quote is going to tie into my thesis. So I said, in Glass Castle, Jeanette Walls and her three siblings will face many instances of neglect and abuse, but will later triumph over the difficulties of their childhood. Okay, so that's my tie-in. We said the orange means people in general, people who are alcoholics, of, or who are adult children of alcoholics in general, now I'm going to make it more narrow and specific, and I'm going to talk about Jeanette Walls. And you're going to need to mention in your introduction, The Glass Castle, too. You might not be focusing on Jeanette Walls, but you do need to let the reader know that you're going to be talking about your issue with whatever examples you're going to pull out of The, the Glass Castle. Okay? And then, of course, my thesis doesn't change. Jeanette Walls, personal success later in life as a result of being forced to be resourceful, have courage, and raise yourself. Okay, so notice that the first and last part of this are, are always the same wording. My background information, my thesis is not going to change. Let's try it for the next one. 
Okay, our next one, everybody, is going to be an introduction with a poem. So this is going to be a little bit more, um, I guess we could say literary or maybe more of a reflective type of uh, hook to get people thinking about um, a philosophical way of looking at life, reflecting on it that way. So purple, same same introduction with the background. Orange tells the hook. The hook is the poem. and But I have to introduce the poem, so I'm going to say, however, remember, this is the negative, but I have to focus on the positive, so I have to show a transition that shows that I'm going to go from negative to positive. So I say, however, an excerpt from a, the poem, Resilience, by poet Cynthia Buhain Bailo. For out of adversity's crucible comes strength of character and will, and a man discovers he is able to reach his goals, his dreams fulfill. So we know, and if you're not familiar with adversity's crucible, adversity means any problems or struggles or obstacles that you're facing. A crucible is a place, a holder of all of that. Well, childhood is your crucible of how you learn to be an adult. So that's the the holder of your experiences. Your child is a, is a particular holder, so a crucible is a holder. Um, you might know this from chemistry. A lot of times you put chemical chemicals all together in this container, and it holds that reaction or whatever. So basically, so all these problems held in your childhood, you can come out with strength of character, and you can discover you can reach your, grow, your goals and fulfill your dreams. And I'm going to say that about Jeanette, right? So this is how this poem, written by this poet, is going to tie into my thesis beautifully. And yet it seems, you know, really, um, really a, a beautiful way to put it. So, because they're not my words, it is not my work, I give you the title of the poem, I give you the poet, I quote exactly the words that are not mine, and then I give you the source, which is um, Author's Den. Okay, so Author's Den, you can use that if you want to use a poem. There's many authors on that. The green ties my hook to my thesis, because I can't just force the two together. I've got to bridge it. So I say here, we can see many examples of how adversity can be overcome with examples in the novel, The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls as a child. Okay. Jeanette Walls, and then we go into my thesis. All right, I believe I have one more that I want to show you. And you are welcome to look at these as many times as you want to. And, um, of course, I'm here to help you as well. So you can get on a I Have a Question, our forum there, and ask me to help look at uh, what you're trying to do. If you're kind of confused, you can ask other people in class. So let's look at that last one, and I'll go ahead and put the colors there for you so we can make the connections. Okay, so the next and last type of introduction that I'm going to work with you today is on two things. Now, you don't have to just use one hook. You can use two. I wouldn't recommend more than two, but you could if, it's, if it works, if it flows, if it's powerful, if it's relevant, if it connects, then you could use more than two. But again, I wouldn't um, do that necessarily, especially if you're beginning to do it. So I've, I've introduced the red color here, and you'll find out the reason why. But again, purple, same background information. Orange means that I'm using the hook. This time it's going to be a statistic and an anecdote together. So the orange is the statistic. In fact, according to the National Association of Children of Alcoholics, 43% of the adult population has been exposed to alcoholism in some way. And in the U.S. alone, 18 million are children. I paraphrase that. That's why there's no quotes around it. But I cited it because that's not my statistics. I didn't go out there and do that survey. I didn't do that study. So even though I found the fact and I paraphrased it, I put it in my own words, that's not my research. So I cited where it came from, the National Association of Children of Alcoholics. In fact, I need to put the web address in parentheses, which I'll do a little bit later. 
And then the red is another anecdote, and or it's another hook, which is an anecdote. And the anecdote is a personal story that I can relate on a more personal level to bring somebody into my story. So here I'm going to talk about my own mother, who is an adult child of an alcoholic. Both her parents were, actually. So I say, here's my personal story, very personal, sharing. My mother is an adult child of an alcoholic. She and her siblings grew up with both parents drinking in the home. They were often left to care for one another, cook for the family, even at an early, very early age, clean the house, get themselves to school, find a way to do schoolwork on their own, and survive the numerous exposures to the father's threatened gun violence against the mother. Though these shocking events could have had negative consequences, my mother still grew up to go to the college, raise two children in an alcohol-free home, marry a wonderful husband and father, and live a very happy life regardless of her upbringing. Okay, so now does that, doesn't that sound like Jeanette? Now you guys are not far enough along in the book to know um, all the successes that Jeanette had, but when you first read the book, you understood that she lived on... She lived in Manhattan. She was very rich. She was taking a cab. She saw her mother in the dumpster. She was a very different lifestyle than what she grew up in. So the green part, again, is I've got to connect that hook, that personal story, to, um, to my thesis. So that's in green. In the book, The Glass Castle, Jeanette Walls and her three siblings will face many instances of neglect and abuse, but will later triumph over the difficulties of their childhood. And then... I make it more specific. I talk about Jeanette Walls personally. And so that's what I'll be focusing on. Okay, so you guys are going to do an exercise like this. I'm going to ask, ask you to color code yours as well because I want you to be thinking of this exercise logically. I want you to take it apart. I want you to dissect it. I want you to be able to explain to me and to your fellow students what you're doing, where's your background information, where's your hook, where's your tie-in sentence, where's your thesis, all right? We're going to practice this. I know it, it sounds hard, and it can be, and I'm the teacher, so, you know, I, I, I've had years of practice at this. So I want you to be able to do your own, make your mistakes, not have very high vocabulary if, if you're struggling with that right now. Your grammar is not going to be perfect. Your logic might be off a little bit. You might struggle with tying those two together. But guess what? That's why you're in ESL 350, and that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you. I don't expect you to come up with these perfect, perfect introductions when you first sit down. Okay? So um, I hope this is helpful. I know it was long, but you can take it in little bites and pieces and apply it to your own learning and your own introduction. Say, okay, everyone, I'll see you in class.